So, welcome Nora, and thank you very much for agreeing to do this interview. And, and uh, thank you also for your very beautiful film on the life and the work of your father, Gregory Bateson, uh, which is both, both touching and very illuminating because of the way you bring in your own relationship to your father. So, so if we could start uh, with, um, in the film you use a quote from Gregory, uh, which I think is very pertinent, in which he says, the major problems in the world are the result of the difference between how nature works and the way people think. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and when you quote that, you then say, so what does it mean to change the way we think? So, so let me ask you that question. What, what does it really take to change the way we think so that it's more in line with how nature works and how nature operates? I wish I could tell you what it's really going to take. If you had asked me what might those changes look like, I could give you a, a vision of an idealized world in which we were able to see the interrelationships and the integrity of systems and systems within systems. Um, but what it's going to take to get there, I don't know. You know, we, we have come to a moment where we're happily throwing around words mm. like ecology and interconnectedness. And still those ideas have deeply mechanized implications. Mm. So some of even the people I work with that are in systems and adaptive systems and very high level complexity um, work, they are utilizing the vocabulary and the conceptual models for this work, but they're doing it with a kind of reductionism that is just yeah. as mechanical yeah. as if they weren't using those terms. Um, that's one of the things we have to watch out for. It's mm. easy to use the word systems. It's easy to talk about complexity and interconnectedness. But what does that mean? What does it mean to be interconnected? How do the, the deep resonances and dynamics of relationship actually change what we're looking at? Because that's what we have to be willing to do, is allow mm. things to be much less concrete than we think they are. Which is not a kind of romance for uncertainty. Mm. Uncertainty is important, but more than anything is the humility mm. of knowing, you know, Peter, I don't know you. And I could make assessments of you. And some of them could be right, a little bit. But when I engage in that process of making these judgments and assessments, of categorizing another living system, if I erase the complexity of you, what have I done? What violence is that mm -hmm. to do mm -hmm. to another person, let alone a forest or a school system or a, you name it. And for me, the most success that I've really seen is just the practice of zooming in and zooming out, whatever it is. If I think about you, Peter, in terms of your relationships, okay? Let's describe you in terms mm -hmm. of your relationships. And now we're going to have a couple different layers of that. One layer is from this boundary mm -hmm. inward and all the relationships that exist inside you. The relationships in your organs, the relationships of the microbacteria that live in you, the relationships of the breakfast you had and the, the temperament of your soul today and what someone said to you before you came in here, what you're worried about, how the traffic mm. was, how you, mm. who are you on the inside, what's in there, 
how if I were to describe all those relationships, and then if I were to describe you in terms of the relationships that are on the outside mm. of this boundary, what would I, what stories would I be telling? Mm. And then if I were to describe you in a larger system, it could be your professional world. It could be your, the country of England and your identity in your culture. Mm. But it doesn't stop there either, does it? So this process of zooming out and zooming in mm. gives us the detail that we need. I mean, you know, de there's nothing wrong with details. I'm not saying that it's not okay to look at the fragments, to look at the pieces, but it is important to be able to see them as they are interacting inside larger contexts. Yes, I often um, talk about the need, whatever we're focusing on, to be able to see the system that it's nested within mm. and the systems that are nested within it. Exactly. So that we always can hold three levels of system at the same time. And that's, that's hard work. It's hard work, especially when we are using these tools of perception, of thinking, of being mm. in organizational work. It is easy to see the edge of the system as the edge of the organization. Mm. I, for me, I would really like to, just for the token of it, to say it's really important to remember that the edge of the system is not the edge of the organization. It's the biosphere. Mm. And no matter what it is that we are working on, when we draw that line, and we will draw lines around systems, around the context, where have we drawn it and why? Because to, that's the question mm. of accountability. Where does the accountability of the organization stop? Very important, you know, I think your father used to say that um, we, we have to draw lines in order to make sense of the world, but true madness is, is drawing a line as a boundary and thinking, you know, using the analytical scissors and thinking the cut belongs in reality rather than it's just something you've done to make sense of something. What you said earlier about how, how do, where do organizations draw their boundaries and, and more and more working with organizations, the, the boundary is not around who works in the organization. You also have to look at no organization exists apart from the biosphere which is resourcing it and through which it is operating on. Mm. So, so how do we look at the more than human world? Well, what I am saying is that we need to develop another kind of information from which to make decisions. So that we, right now, the, the trouble that one institution or one sector causes isn't visible in that sector. It's visible somewhere else, and they're not accountable for it. I hear you saying two very important steps about questions organizations should ask themselves. The first one is, where is the boundary of your organization? Very important question. And the second one is, what other systems carry the costs of your system? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and how? And how? What does it look like? What are those relationships? So I often ask organizations to say, well, look, look, tell me who are your stakeholders? And, and who is the stakeholder you're not seeing? Mm -hmm. So BP didn't see fishermen on the east coast of America as a really important stakeholder. And yet... Let alone the marsh. 
or the marsh or the or the fish life or right. the, yeah so who are the stakeholders we're not very important question but for leaders okay you know when we're working with coaches and mm. leadership workshops and what would be so nice is if we showed up with a PowerPoint and it had the four steps and the five applications and the a couple of nice stories and a nice video that shows how you know this important person thinks these thoughts and then there's a conclusion and here's your package and we're going to call it the did it about right and it's the it and so then did it about becomes the itness of the conference world and there's books and there's methodologies and there's and it's the four steps and the five applications mm. and that this and you get the arrows and the boxes and the this and the that yep uh and nobody's home there's nobody home there because the creation of a solution is not in the solution mm. it's not there there's no formula you can make or methodology you can create for the solution to a problem in a complex system. What we have is an approach to mm. that system as a whole. And the information that becomes part of that approach will allow us to see ways in which we might work with it. But to predetermine those is a fallacy. So you'll say it can't be mechanistic. We have to do it through, through co-creation, through dialogue with the people who are part of the systems. Where we draw, draw that boundary is going to be an a interesting question, as you say. And so the process is as important. It is we can't do mechanistically. We, that process must be a, a living process. It starts off with the way that we see the complexity we're going into. Mm. Because if we see the headache and we treat the head, we are going to miss. We might cure the headache for fifteen minutes, but the patient might be back next week. Mm -hmm. with a shoulder ache and a hip ache and we just moved uh, or two weeks later with a kind of depression in some other office mm. or a divorce in some other office let's come back to because you talked about you mentioned coaches and, and the problem of uh, of this being recognized and you know the, the the methodology but you've talked about how do we help people think in new ways? How do we help them ask new questions? How do you think coaches who work with executives, work with leaders, work with politicians, how, how can they most help? Mm. I think we all need as many fellow human beings around us as possible that can help remind us to try to keep in focus the relationality of whatever it is that we're looking at. So, so if, if, if the, the CEO turns up for coaching and says, look, I've got a problem with my FD. Yeah, the first thing the coach needs to say is, I'm not going to solve your problem for you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so that's the first thing. And the yeah. thing is, there's no money in that. Yeah. So, I mean, really, this is something we have to address, is this idea that we're going to give a formula, find a solution. Yeah. Give the answer. So step it's one, a disaster. I, step one, I, I'm not going to solve your problem. Yeah, so I'm not going to solve your problem. But but, but let's explore um, how how you are part of creating a difficulty between you and the FD. Or what does it look like if you describe it in terms of relationships? And that can get weird. Yeah. Because you know some of those relationships have to do with relationships in people's past that are being recalled. And that's valid. It doesn't have to be what's in the here and now. What the psychoanalysts would call transference. What you and me would call memory. Yeah. Or playing out, or playing out old patterns. Right. 
And that's the next step is to play with the patterns. Mm. So if we look at it from another point of view, deepen our understanding. We're never going to understand it completely. That's okay. We're not going to solve the problem and we're not going to understand the problem. But what we're going to do is understand it more deeply. But it, but it also mean, it may also mean that, that there's a clash because that the board for whom the CEO works and the FD works have not connected the needs of the investor and the needs of the customer and the needs of the employees. And so the FD is holding the needs of the investor and the CEO is holding the needs of the customer. And so it's, there you go. The it's headache, not personal at all. The headache is not the problem. No. That's ex so you look at the first question could be, is this even between you? Because more than likely, it's a contextual situation that has a much larger frame. And it might have to do with how information goes back to the board. So actually, that's a nice question. We could ask, who, whose conflict are you and the FD enacting? Right. But there's another piece to that, which is that there are some patterns of communication um, in ecological systems that we have become familiar with. Hmm. And being familiar with those patterns is enormously useful. So, so if I hear you right, one of the things you're saying to coaches is if we understand that, that, that human ecologies, natural ecologies are made up of relationships and relationships, the fuel of relationships is communication. And as a coach, it's how do you help them shift the patterns of communication that will shift the relationships, that will shift the ecologies, is, is part of... I think that's almost it. Because I think the shifting of communication comes with the shifting in the way we see the communication. I don't think we right. can shift it until we see... Because you could say something different. But if you don't actually have a vision behind that difference, it's not going to matter. So we don't actually have to focus on shifting the communication. It will change. If, if we can see the stories we're creating. Yeah. And how we're creating them. The, the change is, a, is by default. It's a natural consequence. I'd love to ask you what one of the things, particularly in, in, in your father's later writing, is he writes about grace and beauty mm. and the sacred. How do we have a sacred which isn't mystical and supernatural? But, but how do we not get caught in? And, 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 you know, where is the space in this work for working with grace and beauty and the sacred? Just as a way of ending. Um, when you gave me the questions that you were going to ask me, one of them had to do with this uh, quote that's in my film. Um, it yes. all the are. The pathology of thinking in which we all live yes. can only be corrected by an enormous discovery of the relationships which make up the beauty of nature. Okay. That quote could really easily be misunderstood as, are you romantic enough to see the beauty of a sunset or a rose? Mm. Okay. And that's not what we're getting at. No. What we're getting at is something much deeper and much more rigorous and much more complex. Um, because if you take, for example, um, well, an example I like to use is a vine going up a tree, okay? And you start to notice all the stories that are involved with that vine going up that tree in that particular gesture having to do with where the other trees around it are casting shadows, where the paths are, where people's dogs walk, what kind of bark it is, what sort of insects live there, which seed ended up there that happened to grow mm. on the year that had what kind of weather that managed that. And where was it when there was the storm of a particular year that lasted for three weeks? Or, you know, and there's a whole lot of information in the gesture of a vine going up a tree. True. And 
if you can begin to see those stories, suddenly the simple vine on a tree is so beautiful mm. in all that it brings together. Um, and all that it connects with. And all that it connects with and all the relations. And there's a kind of poetry to that. And, and, and your, your father loved quoting Blake, so perhaps we should end with one of his favourite quotes of Blake, which was, um, to see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, to hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. So thank you for this hour. Thank you. It was very nice. And thank you for your sharing. Thank you. It's been very wonderful to enjoy a conversation with you.